Hey everybody, welcome to Talking Scripture, a podcast where we illustrate relevance and application of the scriptures in Come Follow Me. We also dive into the history and cultures of the text. Thanks for taking the time to share and subscribe to this podcast. For show notes, head over to our website, TalkingScripture.org. Welcome to Talking Scripture. I'm Mike. And I'm Bryce. And today we are going to be doing section 64, 65, and 66. Section 64 is September 11th, 1831. This is when Joseph gets back from Missouri, and some of the missionaries are now arriving back in Ohio. And a big part of the context of this section is Ezra Booth. Ezra Booth accused the prophet Joseph of lightness and levity and a proneness to jesting and joking, and a temper easily irritated. And so with his spirit of accusing the prophet Joseph, he actually starts to convince some of the early members of the church to leave the church. And he's one of the first people to write articles against the church of Jesus Christ and attacking the prophet. And we'll come to it again when we get to section 71, because Joseph and Sidney are going to have to take some time away from the work on the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible to answer him publicly. And so in this section, the Lord is going to acknowledge Joseph's weaknesses. Once again, this is one of those times where we see the Lord not only rebuking others, but also acknowledging that Joseph Smith is a person. And To me, a big part of this section is how do we look at other people uh, when, when we see their faults? How do we view them? I believe that Ezra Booth is a big part of this section as a backdrop. Knowing that story that he's a disaffected member of the church, he's going to come at the church after this revelation has come out. And so knowing that, you'll see the story kind of flowing through the verses. And so we're going to talk about forgiveness and mercy, and how we view others. In fact, I love the word compassion in verse 2. So with that as a backdrop, Bryce, why don't you talk about some of the important things in this section? So when the Lord reveals section 64, it is the next step on this quest to build Zion. Let me take everyone back to section 63, verse 24. This is the will of your God concerning his saints. Notice it's not, this is the will of God concerning you particular saints. And then he says, I need you to assemble and build Zion. So I take that as a very generic, all of the Lord's saints are to build Zion. But this time in section 64, he kind of once again confirms that it's not going to happen in their day. Let's read carefully, starting in verse 29. He's talking about Newell Whitney and Sidney Gilbert, and he says, you are agents, and you're on the Lord's errand. And then now listen, verse 30. He has set you to provide for his saints in these last days, that they may obtain an inheritance in the land of Zion. I, the Lord, declare unto you, and my words are sure and shall not fail, they shall obtain it. Meaning, all of these early saints that strove for an inheritance in Zion will obtain an inheritance in Zion. The Lord is going to keep his promise. But notice verse 32. But all things must come to pass in their time. Looking back from our perspective of the future, it sure seems like the Lord is clearly saying it's not going to happen in your dispensation. The Lord seems to be saying to that first generation of saints, it's not going to happen this time. Now, how many times has he hinted at that? Section 57, he says, this is where we're going to build Zion. And then right next to it in section 58, he says, but blessings come after tribulation. He keeps hinting at the suggestion that it wasn't going to happen in that first generation. So why would the Lord send them out there, give them all the instructions, knowing it wasn't going to happen with them, knowing that they were not going to be the celestial people prepared to build a celestial city? Why does he seem to set them up for failure? And maybe I'm wrong, but in my brain, there seems to only be one explanation, and that is... He is speaking to us, every succeeding generation, that we need to learn the lesson of their attempt to build Zion in 1831 through 33. 
we need to understand what the Lord was telling them, and we have to become the people that they didn't become. Someday, there will be a generation of saints prepared to physically build Zion. In the meantime, we owe it to them to build it spiritually. So, therefore, these sections mean a lot to us. Here are the keys. Here is how you become the kind of people that will build Zion. And in section 64, he's going to drop three really big requirements. Among the other things that he's going to say is we have to have the mindset that we are going to build Zion. So if we are the kind of people the Lord wants us to be, what do I need to do to become more of a celestial person? And the first thing in section 64 might very well be the most difficult of all celestial requirements. I really do believe that this first one is one of the greatest litmus tests to see if you are becoming a celestial person. And that is the command to forgive others. That's what celestial people do. That's what God does. The most divine thing that God does is he forgives. I love how that creeps up in the section, Mike. Look at verse 16. In 15, he's been angry with Ezra Booth and Isaac Morley. But notice in verse end of verse 16, nevertheless, I have forgiven my servant Isaac Morley. That's the Lord's nature. And I think it could have also been Ezra Booth if he would have had the had, heart. Had he repented, yeah. had he done what Isaac Morley did. But he doubled down on it, and he went the other way. Then I look at verse 17. Now, tell me the, the disposition of the Lord here. Verse 17 is kind of a call out of Edward Partridge. He has sinned, and Satan seeketh to destroy him. But when these things are made known... I know that he'll repent, and boom, he'll be forgiven. Notice the disposition. As soon as he repents, they shall be forgiven. That's the Lord's nature. He is a forgiving being. One of my absolute favorite statements on the character of God comes from lectures on faith. I don't know exactly who wrote the lectures on faith, but I attribute it to Joseph Smith. And Joseph says the following about God's nature. Unless he was merciful and gracious, slow to anger, long-suffering and full of goodness, such is the weakness of human nature and so great the frailties of, and imperfections of men, that unless they believed that these excellencies existed in the divine character, the faith necessary to salvation could not exist, for doubt would take the place of faith. And those who know their weakness and liability to sin would be in constant doubt of salvation if it were not for the idea which they have of the excellency of the character of God. Now listen to the description of the character of God. That he is slow to anger and long-suffering and of a forgiving disposition and does forgive iniquity, transgression, and sin. An idea of these facts does away doubt and makes faith exceedingly strong. Now, the reason I point that out is if that's the quality of our celestial heavenly Father, doesn't it therefore suggest that anyone that wants to become a celestial being needs to develop that very quality? Somewhere in my eternal progression, I have to be as slow to anger and quick to forgiveness that Heavenly Father is. These are significant things to talk about. I cannot go to the celestial kingdom and be a celestial being until I can do what Heavenly Father does. And He is of a forgiving disposition and does forgive iniquity. So the Lord is in this section going to talk to us about if, if my people are going to be a celestial people and build a celestial city, they have to learn to forgive. Forgive one another their trespasses. So to jump with me to section 64. 
Let's talk about two doctrines that the Lord identifies in these verses. So here's the setting. Mike talked about the setting that they have found faults in Joseph Smith. Exactly, Bryce. I mean, think about it. If you go for a thousand mile journey with Joseph and you're camping and and you're around him all the time. You're going to see his human. Yeah. I mean, think about this. Who knows more about our, our flaws? It's our families, those that we live with. And we see them all the time because we're with them. And I think that, once again, we're back to expectations. I think that Joseph didn't meet Ezra's expectations of what a prophet was. And then he just goes all out against the prophet. In fact, and this is very sad, you look at the date, September 11th, 1831, in just a few months, in six months' time. So fast forward to March of 1832, Ezra Booth is going to be among some of the men that almost kill the prophet Joseph Smith, that come out and physically attack him. It kind of reminds me when we talked about Mosiah, where you talked about the traditions of the Lamanites, and it started with Wronged, that anger. and anger. But then that anger turned to hatred, which then turned to violence. And so Ezra Booth is in the anger stage, but he's going to actually cause Joseph harm in six months. So anyway, back to what you were saying. So that's the background, is they've seen Joseph's flaws— And so the Lord kind of picks up and says, verse 7, Yes, Joseph did sin. And I say unto you, I have forgiven his sins because he repents and he asks for forgiveness. Verse 8, My disciples in days of old sought occasion one against another and forgave not one another in their hearts. Now he's going to reveal doctrine number one. And for this evil, they were afflicted and sorely chastened. And I would suggest my practical human experience tells me that it's not God who afflicted them. It was the very nature of not forgiving. An unforgiving heart will afflict and sorely chasten you. In other words, doctrine number one is, if you don't forgive someone else, the person that gets hurt is you. President Kimball said this. He said, if we've been wronged or injured, forgiveness means to blot it out completely from our minds. To forgive and forget is an ageless counsel. To be wronged or robbed, said the Chinese philosopher Confucius, is nothing unless you choose to remember it. Yeah. It's like, it, it's by its very nature, the consequence of having that kind of disposition is preloaded into the action itself. Yeah, and this is what's so silly if you think about it. So someone hurts me, and then I hold an unforgiving grudge against them, and that hurts me again. So first you hurt me, and then I hurt myself. That doesn't make sense. And the Lord is saying, please realize that you are going to hurt yourself by holding on to this unforgiving heart. You will poison you. Now, I know why we do it. Someone hurts me, and I hold on to resentment because that's my way of hurting them. I think that my resentment is going to hurt them. But the reality is my resentment only hurts me. It doesn't hurt them. So I allow them to hurt me a second time. Or it hurts both of us, right? If you come at me and then I come back at you. especially if I act on it. Right, right. Here is a very powerful example from H. Burke Peterson. He said once in General Conference, For much of our lives, we lived in central Arizona. Some years ago, a group of teenagers from the local high school went on an all-day picnic into the desert on the outskirts of Phoenix. As some of you know, the desert foliage is rather sparse, mostly mesquite, cat claw, and palo verde trees, with a few cactus scattered here and there. In the heat of the summer, where there are thickets of this desert growth, you may also find rattlesnakes as unwelcomed residents. These young people were picnicking and playing, And during their frolicking, one of the girls was bitten on the ankle by a rattlesnake. As is the case with such a bite, the rattler's fangs released venom almost immediately into her bloodstream. This very moment was a time of critical decision. They could immediately begin to extract the poison from her leg, or they could search out the snake and destroy it. Their decision made, the girl and her young friends pursued the snake. 
it slipped quickly into the undergrowth and avoided them for 15 or 20 minutes. Finally, they found it, and rocks and stones avenged the infliction. Then they remembered their companion had been bitten. They became aware of her discomfort, as by now the venom had had time to move from the surface of the skin deep into the tissues of her foot and leg. Within another 30 minutes, they were at the emergency room of the hospital. By then, the venom was well into its work of destruction. A couple of days later, I, a I was asked to visit her in the hospital. As I entered her room, I saw a pathetic sight. Her foot and leg were elevated, swollen almost beyond recognition. The tissue in her limb had been destroyed by the poison, and a few days later it was found that her leg would have to be amputated below the knee. It was a senseless sacrifice, this price of revenge. How much better it would have been if after the young woman had been bitten, there had been an extraction of the venom from the leg in a process known to most desert dwellers. How did killing the snake make things any better? The reality is, it cost her her leg. First the snake bit her, and then she destroyed her leg. By holding on to that grudge and that resentment. And the Lord is saying, don't do that. It only hurts you let it go. Be healed by forgiveness and let the poison of an unforgiving heart go. So doctrine number one is you're going to hurt yourself if you hold on to someone's past grudges. And we do that all the time. When our spouses or our children do something, we have a tendency to go back and dig up everything they've ever done in the past and we throw it at them. That is an unforgiving heart, and we cannot do that because it's going to harm us. Now, doctrine number two, back in section 64, verse 9. So doctrine number one is it's going to hurt you. You're going to hurt you, not them. Doctrine number two, verse 9, wherefore I say unto you that you ought to forgive one another, for he that forgiveth not his brother his trespasses standeth condemned before the Lord. Ready? for there remaineth in him the greater sin. That's a significant statement. I commit the greater sin by not forgiving than you commit against me by hurting me. I stand accountable for the offense I'm making against the atonement of Christ. So to clarify, turn with me to the parable of the unforgiving servant in Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 21, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And then the Savior gives this parable. He talks about a king who takes an account and servant number one comes to the king who owes him 10,000 talents. Now, 10,000 talents is a weight. Long story short, a talent is 75 pounds. 10,000 talents, and assuming we're talking gold here, 10,000 times 75 pounds at today's price of gold is over $20 billion. Now, that's rough estimate here. You can correct my math later. But $20 billion. So servant number one owes the king $20 billion. And his occupation is he's a servant. He cleans the horse stable or he washes dishes. This is not an oil tycoon. This is a servant in the king's service. And he owes the king $20 billion. Now, do you see what the Lord's setting up? We are servant number one. And we owe God more than we would ever be able to pay back. We owe him for our lives. We owe him for the transgressions we commit. We owe God far more than we can pay back. I love verse 26 where he's, he gets down. And he's like, have patience with me and I'll pay thee all. Yeah. And the point Jesus is making is, no, not in a thousand lifetimes. It's not going to happen. You never could pay him right. back. So the Lord loosed him. I love that phrase. He loosed him and he forgave the debt. Now, servant number one goes out and finds servant number two that owes him a hundred pence. 
Now, assuming that Pence was, a, you know, Matthew chapter 20, the servants work all day and gets a penny, and plural of that would be Pence. So if a penny is a working man's daily wage, a hundred pence is approximately $10,000. Servant number two owes servant number one about $10,000. And servant number one won't forgive him. He throws him in jail and shows him no mercy. Now tell me, who does servant number one offend here? He had every legal right to throw servant number two in jail. But who does he offend here? He offends the king who was willing to erase a $20 billion debt. So him insisting that a $10,000 debt be paid is now going to cost him $20 billion. Because as soon as he offends the king, the king gives him back his debt. Now that's horrible investing strategy. To be so concerned about $10,000 that it costs you $20 billion. The whole point being, I should be so grateful for the $20 billion debt that's been erased in my life that I should be just that generous with the $10,000 debts of the people who come against me. Particularly my spouse, my children, my work colleagues, my neighbors. The worst they can do to me is a $10,000 debt. And if I get obsessed over that $10,000 debt, and if I insist that they pay what they owe me, it's going to cost me $20 billion because I am offending the king who was so willing to erase my debt by being unwilling to re- erase someone else's. It's also a miserable way to live life, to walk around always keeping score, always in your head thinking, well, this person owes me. I mean, that just is not a way to live. Yeah. And so the Lord is teaching us a celestial attribute here. Loose them from the debt. In the Old Testament, on the Day of Atonement, they would take a goat and symbolically lay upon the goat the sins of the people, the burden of the people. And then they would rush that goat out into the wilderness where no one had ever been. And that was called the scapegoat. And it clearly is a reference to the Messiah, to Jesus. But there's a false form of scapegoating. Sometimes we lay the burden of my pain on the person who caused it. And I think that's the most logical thing on earth to do. You caused my pain. Therefore, the burden to ease my pain is on you. I'm going to lay the burden of my pain on your shoulders. You caused that pain. Therefore, you heal me. But they can't heal you. Even when they apologize, all these people who clamor for justice, are they suddenly healed when the bad guy goes to jail or gets executed? Their punishment will never heal you. But what will heal you is the Messiah. If you will lift the burden off the person who caused your pain, if you will loose them from the debt, and lay that burden on the Savior. Now there's someone who can carry it away. There's someone who bought the right to carry it away. But the more we try and insist on other human beings, you must pay the $10,000 debt you owe me. We are looking at inheriting a $20 billion debt. That's foolish. Let it go. Loose it. It doesn't mean God's going to loose it. I love how the Lord picks that thought up in the next few verses. Back in section 64, he says, I, the Lord, will forgive whom I will forgive. But of you, it is required to forgive all men. Sometimes we act like I'm going to be called to witness in the trial, so I have to remember all the details. No. The Lord 
will handle judgment. He doesn't need you as an eyewitness. Loose them of the debt. Let the Lord handle it. So celestial quality number one, if we're really going to be the Lord's people, we have to learn to forgive. We have to loose the debt. And I think that means praying and hoping that they will repent and rejoicing at the thought of their repentance. I think Luke chapter 15 is a great message on forgiveness. What happens when the woman finds the coin or when they find the lost sheep or when the father finds his lost son? They rejoice. But there's someone in Luke 15 who didn't rejoice when his younger brother came home. The father did. The father's disposition is to rejoice when someone repents rather than be angry that they cannot be condemned then. And I think there's a great litmus test of forgiveness. Would you rejoice to see that person in the celestial kingdom knowing that they repented? We've got to work on this. This is crushing the church today. The holding on to grudges and past transgressions and $10,000 debts. And it's costing us billions of dollars. And that's foolish. I really love President Kimball where he said the injuries inflicted by neighbors or relatives or even by spouses are generally of a minor nature, at least at first. We must forgive them. Since the Lord is so merciful, must not we be? I want to reference the great story about Heber J. Grant. It's a beautiful story about this man that had done some wrongs, very serious things. And Heber J. Grant doesn't get into what he had done, but he was coming back into the church. And it's about the spirit that comes over Heber J. Grant as he helped and sat on this council to decide on this brother's membership. And he reads these passages that Bryce has been reading and a spirit comes over him and he makes this statement, which I find profound, where he says, the spirit I feel is of such that if the devil himself applied for baptism, I would let him be baptized. And I think that's the kind of spirit that the Lord wants us to have, where we can see their potential and we just have that willing heart to forgive. And I think about those verses, Bryce, verses 8 through 10, because I think of some extreme examples, even think about the Holocaust. How could you go through this and watch your entire family be killed? And then the Lord says, you need to forgive. And to me, I just, the only way make any of this makes sense in my mind is the Savior's ability not only to fix it, but to heal it. I mean, it's one thing to raise them from the dead, but it's another thing to make them whole. And I believe in that. I believe in his ability to compensate. And I don't totally understand it, but I've seen the law of compensation in my life to a small degree, so I have faith. Yeah. Sometimes it's big, but the nature of forgiving others is a celestial quality that we have to develop. My mom, before she died, talked to me about this because I had somebody who did a lot of harm to me, and I couldn't forgive him. And I'll never forget, she said to me, okay, you can't forgive him now, ask Heavenly Father to give you that spirit to want to do that. And it worked. That was my prayer. Just help me to want to do that. And I really do think it's tied into those verses on charity. Pray with all the energy of your heart. So if you're listening to this right now and there's somebody in your life that you're just so not forgiving and you're like, and you feel justified, let this be an invitation to go to the Lord and say, Lord, help me to want to do that. There are a couple others I just want to mention in section 64, kind of attributes of a celestial kind of people. Starting in verse 22, he says, I, the Lord, require the hearts of the children of men. And then he expands on that in verse 34. I, or the Lord, requireth the heart and a willing mind, and the willing and obedient shall eat the good of the land of Zion in these last days. It's that I, the Lord, require the heart. Telestial sins are often the sins we commit outwardly. It's the violent acts I do with my hands. It's the lies that come out of my mouth. Terrestrial transgressions are often committed in our hearts. It's the resentment. It's the anger that we feel inside of our heart. 
And so becoming a celestial person has a lot to do with rendering our heart to God and changing what we feel, changing what we think, and living the gospel inside our hearts. Those of you who have been to the temple, there is a certain moment where we pray. I want you to think about who is not allowed to participate in that prayer. And there's something about, if the, if the temple is teaching us to be celestial, then if I happen to be in the temple with someone I have strong feelings against, I would not be allowed to participate. What is that saying to me about me? The Lord requires the heart. We commit terrestrial sins in our heart. So do you remember last time in section 63, the Lord says, look, adultery doesn't have a place in the kingdom. Adultery is a celestial sin that must be repented of. And then he went on to say, but so is looking at a woman and lusting after her. There's your terrestrial sin that has no place in our hearts if we want to be a celestial people. We have to render our heart to God and allow our heart to be in harmony with Heavenly Father. And it, it's not just those. I mean, in the Sermon on the Mount, the Savior does that with several things. Yeah. Hey, this is what you do with your hands. This is what you do with your bodies. But I say, and then he invites us to this state of holiness. And so that's a really good reminder. And by the way, in the context of this revelation, it's given in the context of Isaac Morley being asked to sacrifice something great. Right. And you'll find hints at this all throughout this section. So go back to verse 16. Notice he says, they sought evil in their hearts, and I, the Lord, withdrew my, withheld my spirit. They sought evil in their hearts. Now, they didn't go beat the guy up. That would have been a celestial act. But they sought evil in their hearts, and that was the terrestrial sin that is not worthy of celestial people. The sad thing is it's coming later. Yeah, in six months, they come. are going to actually hurt Joseph. But then look at verse 20. I love this hint here. Isaac was told to sell his farm. Why? That he may not be tempted above that which he is able to bear and counsel wrongfully to do your hurt. I wonder if the Lord knew about the escalating land prices that were coming in Kirtland and said, Isaac, get out now before it's even a temptation. Don't let the temptation in your heart. So again, that reference to you've got to get it out of your heart. So quite often throughout section 64, it's this idea that we need to give God our hearts. And I love the concept from Neil A. Maxwell that my heart is the only thing I really have to give to God. My time is not mine to give to him. It's like the child asking for $10 to buy the dad a birthday present. It really wasn't the child's gift. If my money is my gift to God, then it really doesn't count because money is God's anyway. My time and my money are not mine to give to God. But the one thing I can give God is the one thing he cannot take from me. If he takes it from me, he ceases to be God. And that's the only thing that's really mine to give. And that's my heart. I can keep it or I can give it to him. I love how Boyd K. Packer said it to God early on in his life. He said the following, I want to be good. I'm not ashamed to say that. I want to be good. And I have found in my life that it has been critically important that this was established between me and the Lord so that I knew that he knew which way I had committed my agency. I went before him and in essence said, now this is Boyd K. Packer to his heavenly father, I am not neutral, and you can do with me what you want. If you need my vote, it's there. I don't care what you do with me, and you don't have to take anything because I give it to you, everything, all I own, all I am. End quote. That's what Boyd K. Packer said. And then Boyd K. Packer added this, speaking to us, and that makes the difference. 
we ha- my heart is the only thing I can truly give God. And the giving of it to God is what makes me into the kind of person that he is. Because God has given his heart to us. We are his work and his glory. So there's the second one. Forgive and give your heart to God. And I would throw one more in from this section, as long as we're talking about the kind of people we need to be in order to build Zion. I love that verse 23, the Lord says, it is called today until the coming of the Son of Man. So basically from 1831 to whenever the Lord comes, he says, is today. So I can accurately tell people I know exactly when Jesus is coming. He's coming today. Now, I think what I find in that is an attitude of success. I will not procrastinate my preparation for Jesus. I will act today. I'm going to live my life assuming that Jesus is coming today. We saw that in the Joseph Smith's rendition of Joseph Smith Matthew. The greatest preparation for dealing with the latter days is not to get ready when he comes, but to be ready no matter when I live. Being ready for his coming will make us the very people that will survive the days ahead. We have to have that attitude. I will not procrastinate my preparation. Think about a young person that says, today is my mission call, even though they're 16. Today is the day I get called on a mission. What about young people who are dating and they say, today is the day I enter the temple. Today is the day I walk into the temple and I make covenants with the Lord. Why is it that God has not told us when the Savior's coming? He deliberately withholds the time of his coming. That's because he knows what human beings would do if they knew when he was coming. We would procrastinate our preparation. So the Lord says, I don't want you to know, so that you will always be ready. And in there is the secret of living a celestial life. Today is the day I go to the temple. Today is the day I face God. Today. And I'm going to live my life ready to give anyone who needs it a priesthood blessing. I'm going to live my life ready to look God in the eye. Now, I'm going to make mistakes, and which is why I'm going to repent today. I'm not going to put off my repentance. So I would suggest those are three great celestial attributes listed in section 64. We must forgive each other. We must render to God our hearts and a willing mind. And we need to have the attitude that today is the day of my salvation. I love that in one of the accounts of Joseph Smith's early life, he pointed out that about the age of 12, he began to think seriously about the state of his eternal salvation. A 12-year-old was worrying about his standing with God. Is it any wonder why he was the prophet of the restoration? He wasn't putting off looking for God until he was older. It was today. Yeah. So if you go to 66, section 66 of the Doctrine and Covenants is about William E. McClellan. William E. McClellan leaves the church, but he always holds to the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon. But one of his essential contentions is that Joseph doesn't have the keys, that Joseph did his work, that his work was to translate the Book of Mormon, and then Joseph's job, according to William E. McClellan, is to kind of get out of the way, and it's kind of like leadership by committee, meaning that there should be no one in charge, but everyone is in charge. He didn't see Joseph as a prophet, and so he would say things like, hey, Joseph doesn't have the keys. And so if you go to section 64 and you look in verse 5, this is what the Lord says. The keys of the mysteries of the kingdom shall not be taken from my servant Joseph through the means I have appointed while he liveth inasmuch as he obeyeth my ordinances. So the Lord essentially says that Joseph holds the keys and he's going to hold them as long as he is obedient. And 
if you go to section 90 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord says this about the prophet Joseph. Verily I say unto you, the keys of this kingdom shall never be taken from you while you are in the world, neither in the world to come. Nevertheless, through you shall the oracles be given to another, yea, even unto the church. Then go with me to section 28, verse 7. For I have given him, meaning Joseph, the keys of the mysteries and the revelations which are sealed, until I shall appoint unto them another in his stead. And then section 35 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Speaking about the keys, the Lord says this in verse 18. And I have given unto him, meaning Joseph, the keys of the mystery of those things which have been sealed, even things which were from the foundation of the world, and the things which shall come from this time until the time of my coming. And then notice the caveat in verse 18, the word if. If he abide in me, and if not, another will I plant in his stead. Which, by the way, suggests Joseph Smith will still translate the sealed portion of the gold plate someday. Whatever that means. To me, I see Joseph on both ends of the veil as the head of this dispensation. I see the promises of invulnerability that were given to him were the same kinds of promises promised to the servants of God in, in the Psalms. And we'll do that when we get to the Old Testament. But that's kind of big picture what I see with that. And then if you go to 43, verse 4, and look what the Lord says to Joseph about the keys here. To me, this is really important because this is going to be the argument that the Whitmers are going to have. This is going to be the argument that many who leave the church in the Missouri period are going to state. They're going to say things like, Joseph had the keys, but he lost them. And if I was there, if I could get, go in a time machine, I would go back in time and I would say, okay, when? When did he give me a time? I would try to pin them down. And I think the argument is worthy because I don't think any one of them could pin it down to the same time. In fact, if you read William E. McClellan's arguments against Joseph, now, in my opinion, they're hard to read. I think church history stuff's really hard to read. And I talked to one of my historian friends about this. Uh, his name is John. John told me, Mike, if you think William E. McClellan's handwriting's hard to read, <laughs> you're in for a rude awakening because William E. McClellan was a school teacher. And so you might read his writing and we'll link it in the show notes and you can read his words. You might say, oh, Mike, this is easy to read. To me, I'm like, Can't, couldn't he have just typed it up? But my point is, from his perspective, William E. McClellan so many times is contradictory in where that line is. When did Joseph stop being a prophet? When was he a prophet? I'll give you an example. He believes to his dying day that the Book of Mormon is from heaven and that Joseph did the work of the Lord. But in the same breath, in the same document, he says things like this. Well, John the Baptist didn't give him the priesthood. That's just made up stuff. Well, historically, he's given the priesthood in the context of the translation work. So to me, some of these ideas are contradictory, but you can read them for yourself and decide. I'm going to read 43, 3 and 4. And this ye shall know assuredly, that there is none other appointed unto you to receive commandments and revelations until he be taken. Meaning, the Lord speaking to the church that nobody's to receive revelations for the church except for Joseph until he be taken. And then we have that if clause, if he abide in me. But verily I say unto you that none else shall be appointed unto this gift except it be through him. For if it be taken from him, he shall not have power except to appoint another in his stead. To me, what that means is this, is that Joseph was to hold the keys on the earth until he be taken, and that collectively the quorum of the 12 apostles held the keys of the kingdom after Joseph died. And the president of the quorum at the time was Brigham Young. And I want to throw out there everyone who claims that Joseph Smith wasn't faithful, therefore he lost the keys at some point in his life. I would read to you God's statement to Joseph from section 132. The Lord says, For I am the Lord thy God, and will be with thee even unto the end of the earth, and through all eternity. For verily I seal upon you your exaltation, and prepare a throne for you in the kingdom of my father with Abraham your father. Behold, I have seen your sacrifices, and will forgive all your sins. I have seen your sacrifices in obedience to that which I have told you. 
Go therefore, and I make a way for your escape, as I accepted the offering of Abraham of his son Isaac. Now this is towards the end of Joseph Smith's life. And the Lord basically confirms in that section that Joseph never faltered. He certainly was an imperfect man and needed to be forgiven of sins, but he always repented. We never needed the clause that says, if you're not faithful, I'll, I'll replace you. And I think that's a good message for us. Stay on the path. Keep going. We're going to stumble along the way. Charles Penrose, he said this. Here the promise was made to the prophet Joseph that he should have those keys as long as he lived if he obeyed the commandments and ordinances of the Lord. Our testimony, now Charles Penrose was an apostle, our testimony is that he lived and died a prophet of God and that he sealed his testimony with his blood. The Lord promised that the keys should not be taken from him while he lived inasmuch as he obeyed his ordinances. So when the prophet Joseph was taken away, the keys were with him as the Lord promised that they should be both in this world and in the world to come. And then Elder Penrose reads the 112th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, verse 14 and 15, which go as follows. Now I say unto you, and what I say unto you, I say to the twelve, arise and gird up your loins, take up your cross, follow me, and feed my sheep. Exalt not yourselves, rebel not against my servant Joseph, for verily I say unto you, I am with him, and my hand shall be over him. And the keys which I have given unto him... And also to you, Ward, shall not be taken from him till I come. So to me, the way I read this is that Joseph holds the keys, but the Lord is also telling the twelve that they will move forward the church. So Charles Penrose then says this. He says, here's the promise of the Lord, not only to the prophet Joseph, but also to the twelve, that the keys should not be taken from the prophet until the Lord should come, For by this time he had been tested, proved, and found worthy. Now, to me, this is an important thing to emphasize, and it's essentially the answer to William E. McClellan's concerns and his questions. William E. McClellan is a big part of why we have Section 1. He saw the frailties in the language and the spelling and the writing and That's another reason why I'm putting his writing in the show notes so you can go to the link. It's in the archives and you can read it yourself and not to be overly critical of William E. McClellan, but his writing isn't so great either. And he misspells stuff and he has to cross stuff out and write in in the side notes, his thoughts. And that's kind of life. Like that's just how it is. And he saw Joseph's frailties. But one of the things about him that I find fascinating is he could never let go of the Book of Mormon because of the spirit of that book. And I see God in heaven doing this on purpose. And as I've studied some of the words of the detractors of the church, many of them struggle with this. Like they see the flaws or they're critical of a bishop or a stake president or some doctrine they don't understand. And they kind of want to use the Burger King phrase, they want it their way. And I think the Lord is trying to tell William E. McClellan and me and you, all of us, It doesn't work that way. And this is difficult because it uses the language of kingdom, which is, this is maybe a good segue into section 65. A kingdom has a king. Now, in the concept of the gospel, that's Jesus. But in the ancient world, there were kings and they represented the gods. And this was kind of how Israel functioned. And so a lot of the Psalms to the kings, and they say today, I say unto you, you are my son, the king represented the Lord. I see this in a sense that President Nelson of the church is the prophet. He's the Navi. He's the one who speaks forth for the king on the earth, but not to the church. It's to the world. And this is one thing our detractors can't understand. A lot of times they'll say things like, oh my goodness, the church of Jesus Christ did this with tithing dollars. And this is kind of also ties into tithing in section 64. Section 64 talks about tithing. And sometimes the church gets criticized because of the tithing that is used for worldly things like buying property. The church is a church, but it's also a kingdom. And a kingdom owns land and has all kinds of material goods. And so if this is the church of Jesus Christ, if this is the kingdom of God, then should it not just be kind of self-evident? that kingdoms will hold property. And so because of that, 
I will just say this. I don't think that the context of Section 64 when it comes to tithing is just about 10%. That's going to come later. I think the context is verse 20. This is verse 20 of Section 64. My servant Isaac Morley may not be tempted above that which he's able to bear, and I give him a commandment that his farm should be sold. That's way more than 10%. And I think it comes in the context of verse 34, the Lord requireth the heart. The Lord tithes our heart and our mind. Yes, I pay 10% of my income as a tithing, but God is asking for all of my heart and all of my mind. That's got to be a critical part of my tithing is that I give God my heart. This isn't just, oh, give 10% of your income. It's... If you want to survive the burning of the days ahead, tithe your heart and your mind. Give them to God. Now, if you're interested, if you want to go down some of these rabbit holes on tithing, there's a document that we link in the show notes called The Brief History of Tithing, and you can see how the church did its best to find a way to make this happen. Today, the members of the church give 10% of their income as tithing, but it did, that's not how it started. And I'm okay with it. I see the Lord up in heaven saying, Joseph, go run the kingdom. Joseph represents the Lord. So in a sense, he is a king. He is a king and a priest, and he's going to build the kingdom the best way that he knows how. Same with his successors and the enemies of the church that tried to say things against the church. When they refer to tithing and these kinds of things, they refer to us as the church. And I understand that. That's okay. But just know that we are a kingdom. And section 64 is about kingdom. Verse 23 is about the king coming. Like he is going to come. And the proud and the wicked, verse 24, it's not going to work out for those guys. So in the context of section 64, you have kingdom in 65, which is the great prayer, which we're going to read. But it also has everything to do with William E. McClellan's apostasy, his leaving of the church. So... If you look in section 66 of the Doctrine and Covenants, William E. McClellan, he goes to the Lord in secret prayer with five questions. Now, he doesn't tell Joseph Smith what the questions are, but in this revelation, it's an answer to a prayer about William E. McClellan's questions, and it's given in October 1831. Now, William E. McClellan would become an apostle, and as we've stated before, he left the church and he became a critic of the church. But at this point, he's pretty excited to have the answer to these questions, and he's faithful at this point. And so, well, what were the questions that he had? Prior to this revelation, McClellan, when he was going to Kirtland, he stepped off a large log, and he writes, I strained my ankle very, very badly. And he strained it so much that he petitioned Joseph to heal him. And then he continues, McClellan says, he laid his hands on my ankle and it was healed, although it was swelled much and had pained me severely. And so according to his his account, he had this miracle happen to him in the sense of him being healed by the power of God. And so on October 29th, he went before the Lord in secret, and then he says, on my knees, I asked him to reveal the answer to the five questions that I had through his prophet. And so without letting Joseph know what the questions were, he asked Joseph Smith to provide for him the Lord's will. And then he says that the questions were answered to his full and entire satisfaction. And so I certainly don't know what the questions were, but you can kind of go through the section and see, based on the context of what the Lord says to him, what his questions were. So for example, I think one of the questions that he had was probably something like this, Lord, this church that I've joined, how does it fit into the religions of the world? And so if you look in verse 2, the Lord says, Blessed are you for receiving my everlasting covenant, even the fullness of my gospel, sent forth unto the children of men that they might have life. And so I see this as big picture as the Lord saying, okay, this little teeny band of Christians is really for the world, for the children of men that they might have life. I think another question he had, this is very common for Joseph as well. When Joseph was young, he would ask questions about his spiritual standing. And so we have verse three. And in this section, the Lord says, you are clean, but not all. Repent, therefore, of those things which are not pleasing in my sight. 
we don't have the specifics on his sin, but I think some of this might go in line with the fifth question that he has regarding uh, being pure. But I like this in verse three, where the Lord says, you're clean, but not all. I think what he's doing, and I think this applies to all of us, is he's extending an invitation to William to get on the path and stay on the path. To me, verse three is also in line with the words remission of sins. You see, we are forgiven of sins, and then we receive what's called a remission of sins. Because of our fallen nature, the seeds of iniquity are always in us. Just like, for example, if someone has had cancer, the cancer goes into remission, but it doesn't mean that it can't come back. And I think that's the process of redemption and salvation and sanctification, that it's a process. But at times in our lives, the Lord gives us justification events where he proclaims us just. We see this, for example, when Joseph was 14 in the first vision, when the Lord proclaimed him clean, or when he was 17 years old and he was praying and the angel Moroni came and he was told that he was clean over and over again. These things happen in connection with the Holy Ghost, where the Holy Ghost comes upon us and the Lord says to us, today you are clean. Now, it doesn't mean you're clean forever. You're clean, but not all. Stay on the path. I think that's one of his questions. What was my standing? I think another question he has probably or possibly the third question would be, what am I to do in the church? Now, I think that goes without saying, because that's what he said to Joseph, where he says, well, what's my role? But if you look in verse five, the Lord says, verily I say unto you, that it is my will that you should proclaim my gospel from land to land and from city to city. And then in verse seven, go to the Eastern lands and bear testimony in, of every place. And then in verse eight, let my servant Samuel H. Smith go with you and forsake him not. And so he's given a companion, he's told where to go, and I think that's the answer to the question. I think the fourth question has to do with the experience that he had with his ankle injury. If you look in verse nine, the Lord says, lay your hands upon the sick and they shall recover. Return not till I, the Lord, shall send you. Be patient in affliction. I think one of the things the Lord is saying, and I think one of his questions is, I've seen people get healed by the power of the priesthood. Will I have this power? And I think the Lord is telling him, yes, you will have this power. And then finally, the fifth question, I think goes with verse 10, where the Lord says, seek not to be cumbered, forsake all unrighteousness, Commit not adultery, a temptation with which thou hast been troubled. I think perhaps after the death of his wife, he was burdened with that idea of how am I going to get through life? How am I going to do this? And I think the Lord is extending an invitation to him that he's going to be able to make it, but that he also has to work on his heart. Verse 12, continuing these things even unto the end. And you shall have a crown of eternal life at the right hand of my father, who is full of grace and truth. William E. McClellan stayed with the church until 1838. And after 1838, on May 11th, he appeared before a bishop's court in far west. And he was removed from the membership roles of the church. And he joined the Mavers in Missouri and robbing and driving the saints from Missouri And there are some things historically that he says that I think need to be tempered with his temperament at this time. And like we mentioned earlier, we're going to link a lot of this stuff in the show notes because William E. McClellan could be a standalone podcast. There are so many things going on with his life that I find it worthy to go and read his words so that you can kind of see where his head's at. So I took a document that he wrote to a man by the name of James Thornton Cobb. Now, James Cobb was the son of one of the plural wives of the prophet Brigham Young, and her name was Augusta. And that is another entire saga on its own. Like, who is he and what's he doing? Short story, James Cobb believes that Joseph Smith used what was called the Spalding Manuscript to produce the Book of Mormon. And so he engages William McClellan later in William's life to try to get William to recant his testimony or to help him make the case that the Book of Mormon is a 19th century production from the genius of the prophet Joseph. And essentially, this 
interchange that they have in these letters is that approach. And in the show notes, we link to the William E. McClellan papers, a document called Some of My Thoughts in 1878, Why I'm Not a Member of the Church. And, you know, I take, if you don't want to read all the writing, I just kind of take the main points and give you just a little taste of what William E. McClellan is saying. But essentially, it's so much of what we've been talking about. He takes major issue with some of the stuff going on in section 21 of the Doctrine and Covenants, where the Lord is a prophet, seer, and revelator, and that he speaks for the Lord. Uh, He takes issue with the idea that Joseph and Oliver were apostles. Now, the irony to this is that William E. McClellan, during 1831-1838, he is ordained as an apostle, so there's some irony there. He takes issue that there should be somebody in charge, that somebody should be uh, the head of the church. And there are so many things that he struggles with, and you'd kind of have to read them, but just big picture, it does kind of remind us of the Whitmer brothers a little bit. And the reason why I'm sharing this is because there's something in William's mind that he can't let go of, and that's the divinity of the text of the Book of Mormon. And he essentially tells James Cobb to quit trying to pull on the thread that it's a 19th century production or that Joseph Smith read the Spalding manuscript and then was able to construct the Book of Mormon. And this is what he says to James Cobb. I have set to my seal that the Book of Mormon is true, that it's a true divine record, and it will require more evidence than I have ever seen to ever shake me relative to its purity. When a man goes at the Book of Mormon, he touches the apple of my eye. He fights against truth, against purity, against light, against one of the truest, purest books on earth. And then he essentially says, fight the church as much as you please, but leave that unique, that inimitable book alone. And so he encourages James Cobb to give up that pursuit. Later in his life, he goes and actually talks to David Whitmer. And so in another letter to James Cobb, he says this, that he spoke to David Whitmer, and then he mentions the loss of David's thumb, how David's right thumb, he had lost it in an accident. And then he says, you know, he can't write. And he, William E. McClellan says, I saw him, meaning David, in June of 1879, and I heard him bear solemn testimony to the truth of the book as sincerely and solemnly as when he bore it to me back in 1831. I believed him then. And I still believe him now. You seem to think that he and I ought to come out and tell you something, some darkness relative to that book. We should lie if we did, for we know nothing against its credibility or divine truth. And so William E. McClellan leaves the church. He's an enemy in in a great sense of the church, but he always continually tries to find ways to hold on to the Book of Mormon, but... In his pursuits, he kind of keeps himself aloof from all these different splinter groups from the church. And during his last year, he says that he believes that the Lord would establish the church shortly. And then if that happens, he says, I hope they'll accept me, that I'll unite with them. And so he dies in 1883 at the age of 77. But I find it so fascinating that the last year of his life, he was hoping that the truths of the Book of Mormon would be found in a church that would be acceptable to him that would then be restored. And I find this so ironic because I see so much of William E. McClellan today swirling amongst what I would call the edges of the camp of Israel. There are so many people that they like what the church teaches. They like the fruits on the tree, but they don't appreciate the roots. And what I mean by that is they want the effects of living the gospel but they don't want to necessarily do the work or believe in the teachings, or they want to believe in some of the teachings, but not the whole thing. And I see this certainly being complicated, certainly like anything, it's a living church. And just like a living tree, roots move. And because it's living, there's always going to be this shifting. And I think William E. McClellan struggled with that. And I think that his life can be a witness to all of us as well. Meaning, do we have the eyes that see the flaws or do we have the eyes that can forgive and forget the flaws and look for the good? And so I see this certainly as a beautiful invitation to all of us to participate in the growth of the tree. I love it. Okay, so with that in mind, knowing that 64, 65, 66 are taking the approach that this is a kingdom 
And 64, how do we build it? Well, we got to have these things in place, people that have these hearts. And then a case study in William E. McClellan in 66, between these two sections is reference to a great vision that's contained in the book of Daniel. But Joseph Smith tells us in the historical records that this is actually a prayer. This is a prayer that he has. And Bryce, I read this as the prayer in the Sermon on the Mount, where the Savior says, we should pray to the Father that his kingdom will come, right? Yeah. What should those of us who belong to the kingdom of God on earth be praying for? And he just reveals it beautifully. We should be praying for the going forth of the kingdom. I love verse 4, pray unto the Father, call upon his holy name, make known his wonderful works among the people. Call upon the Lord that his kingdom may go forth upon the earth. That should be the heartfelt plea of every member of the kingdom, that this kingdom may go forth, that the inhabitants thereof may receive it. Please let them receive it, Lord, and be prepared for the days to come in which the Son of Man may come down in heaven clothed in the brightness of his glory to meet the kingdom of God which is set upon the earth." And here's the culmination of the prayer, verse 6. Wherefore, may the kingdom of God on earth go forth, that the kingdom of God in heaven may come and join it. The unification of those two kingdoms is the millennial day. When we have built up the kingdom and made it worthy of the kingdom in heaven, so that we can merge the two together, and Enoch's kingdom can come back because we're all of one heart and one mind, that will be the most blessed kingdom to ever be part of. And it's when Jesus will actually be the actual king of that kingdom. In the meantime, our prayer, the prayer in every one of our hearts should be, let the kingdom grow, let the world receive it, and let us be prepared for what's to come. Let us be the people we need to be so that we can merge the kingdom on earth with the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of Enoch. And we'll all come and be of one heart and one mind. Pray for those things. Pray for the coming of the bridegroom. Make the supper ready. Prepare the way for the Lord. And I just love that prayer. I read it often because it reminds me what should be in my heart as I move forward. Every day I wake up, every time I teach a class, every time I go to the temple, my prayer is that the kingdom will go forward, that the world will receive it, and that we can become the kind of people that we can unify all these kingdoms into one, and the King of Kings will finally come and reign whose right it is to reign. May we be that people. May we change our hearts and give our hearts to God. And if anyone owes you a $10,000 debt, loose them. Let that go. It's not worth getting the $20 billion debt back. Let's be that kind of people. Let God reign in our hearts so that the kingdom of heaven can join the kingdom on earth. Yep. Excellent. And with that, we thank you. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week. Talking Scripture is not an official production of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The opinions expressed in this podcast are Mike and Bryce's opinions only. We refer you to official church sources and the church website to clarify any doctrinal questions.